Yeah, so I was asked to, to give an update status report on our clinical sequencing exploratory research program, which we've come to call CSER. Um, but I may wander around a little bit on my way uh, there. Um, just some, some historical slides. You know, it's only 10 years ago that we finished the human genome reference. Um, and following that, Francis and Eric and Mark Geyer and others uh, published a vision for the future of genomics research, which included this quote, the technological leaps that seem so far off as to be almost fictional, but which if they could be achieved would revolutionize biomedical research and clinical practice. For example, ability to sequence DNA at costs four or five orders of magnitude lower. Of course, this was the drive to the $1,000 genome. So this was just 10 years ago. And of course, we uh, at NHGRI on our, our genome.gov site uh, maintain this, this graph you've all seen probably on uh, the cost per sequence genome uh, versus Moore's Law. And this inflection point occurred in, in mid-2007 where the next-gen sequencers came online. And we suddenly took a slope that was following Moore's Law and it plummeted. Uh, this graph that I have on here ended uh, July two, uh, two years ago, and, and now we've reached the point in costs where uh, an exome, a whole exome is $1,000, and whole genomes now uh, can be purchased uh, with a prescription from your doctor uh, for $4,500 from aluminum. And it's, it's not ended, it hasn't ended. Um, we've kind of flattened out a bit uh, with the current technology, uh, but there are new tech, newer technologies coming. Uh, Oxford Nano made quite a splash last year with their thumb drive sequencer. This is a, a, a working prototype that you put a drop of uh, blood or whatever into this hole and through nanopore sequencing, the sequence goes right into your laptop, powered by your USB port. Um, um, look for more news from this group, I think, in the next year or so. So um, genomic sequencing is here uh, <laughs> for clinical use, and, and we gotta figure out how to do it. So we've been looking at, at of course, at NHGRI, this, this, this path to genomic medicine, and what do we do with routine genome, genome sequencing uh, coming online, and, and, and this facing uh, all the, the issues that we've been discussing uh, um, led to us to, to, to uh, start the initiative for our, what we call clinical sequencing exploratory research. Um, but briefly before I go there, of course with all the sequence is also all the data, a uh, slide I borrowed from Eric. Um, you know, the, the drinking from the fire hose phenomena is coming, and, and uh, Terry or Lucia commented that we should mention, I don't, it's, it's nowhere else on the agenda, uh, the new initiative at N NHGRI on big data. Um, so, you know, we're all aware of, of the big data issue that's going to uh, get worse. And so at, NH at, at NIH, um, a, a while back, uh, and these are slides from, from Eric. Uh, big Data to Knowledge Initiative uh, was started. NIH is trying to get, get on top of this uh, difficult problem. Um, <clears throat> by the end of the decade uh, at NIH, we'd like to enable a quantum leap in the ability of the research community to maximize the value of the growing volume and complexity of biomedical data. And this, uh, everybody's jumped on board at NIH. Uh, a working group was developed uh, last year with 125 members, and I, almost all, all the NIH institutes and centers uh, are part of this new initiative. And just quickly, um, it, it contains four programmatic areas, uh, a major one in facilitating the broad use of biomedical big data, some of the things we were talking about yesterday, uh, how do we, we share all the genomic and phenotypic data that'll be generated in the clinic and more broadly. Um, developing and disseminating analysis methods and software for big data. Uh, training and uh, an, an effort in, in innovation 
uh, in, in what we like to call centers of excellence uh, to innovate in this area. Um, just where it is, the, the, um, um, we're in the, the, the program is in the, is in the workshop phase. A uh, number of workshops, I uh, mentioned one in particular coming up in September, enabling research use of clinical data. Um, um, relevant if you, if you receive an invitation, I hope you'll consider participating in this, this important workshop. Um, so with the workshops going on uh, this year, then funding will start in, in fiscal year 2014 uh, with a, a, a model of, of actually expanded funding um, leading through the end of the decade. So pretty serious effort uh, and, and uh, gotten pretty well organized at NIH. So I just wanted, wanted to mention that. And now I'll turn back to clinical sequencing. Obviously this was set to alter the clinical landscape. As sequencing, this we're, we're not talking about genotyping. Uh, this is broad genomic sequencing with all the, the, the ramifications for incidental findings and other things that go with that. So we developed this program, CSER, to research the challenges to applying comprehensive genomic sequencing to the care of patients, how to generate an, uh, the generation and application of the genomic sequence data in a clinical workflow and timeline, how to interpret and translate the data for the physician, and communicate these results, the results to the patient. And what was a little bit innovative in this program was, was we, we really wanted the, the, the ethics, the, the, the psychosocial implications to be a, a big part of each of these projects, to be built in and, and be uh, fully integrated with each of these projects. Um, this is, if you've seen the heat map, uh, this program is, is really embedded in, in the fourth domain for the NHGRI uh, uh, strategic plan, advancing the science of medicine, really at this cutting edge of where we are today uh, in trying to move genomics into medicine. Uh, I, just, I point this out partly because I do also do a lot of work in understanding the biology of disease, and, and this program, CSER, is really about understanding and researching process and the psychosocial implications. Uh, rather than discovery of, of new variants and, and associations. So each CSER project uh, has three sub-projects. Each of the sub-projects has, has uh, senior leadership. Um, project one is the clinical study, the, the, the choice for, the, for what uh, uh, clinical question uh, you'll be addressing. Project two is the actual sequencing, analysis, and informatics. Uh, that goes on uh, all the way from variant calling to, to decision support tools. And project three is the important ethical and psychosocial implications. As I mentioned, um, we have each project required strong leadership in all these areas. Um, and then uh, important management structure to, to coordinate this. So these are the current grantees in CSER. Uh, I point out uh, the PIs and also the LC lead uh, for each. University of North Carolina, Jim Evans' uh, name came up several times yesterday uh, with Gail Henderson um, doing exome sequencing for several different disorders in North Carolina. Uh, Levi Garraway and Steve Jaffe lead a project at Dana-Farber uh, looking at, at uh, solid tumor uh, sequencing. Um, the, the expanse of, of, of psychosocial and ethical questions in the projects are quite, quite vast. You know, f f the, the concerns of somebody coming in with, a, with colon cancer, uh, with acute disease, uh, and returning results or, or incidental findings is much different than, than a relatively healthy patient. Um, Robert Green uh, at Brigham and Women's with Amy McGuire at Baylor. Um, have, have our only study that's doing whole genome sequencing. All the others are exome. Uh, they have a, a part of their cohort is actually healthy patients. Uh, they're recruiting uh, to do whole genome sequencing and some longitudinal uh, studies. University of Washington with Gail Jarvik, Wiley Burke, Malia Fullerton uh, is, is looking at colon cancer, colon polyposis. Um, this is not uh, tumor sequencing, but, but actually um, um, looking at, at familial risk uh, for colon cancer. Uh, CHOP uh, with Ian Krantz and Nancy Spinner, uh, looking at pediatrics, a number of disorders, uh, hearing loss, developmental delay, 
uh, a couple of others, a variety of tutorials, also tackling those important ethical questions around pediatric uh, genomic analysis. And uh, Baylor College of Medicine, led by Sharon Plon and Will Parsons, um, um, doing pediatric uh, tumor sequencing. So uh, quite a diverse group. Um, we uh, reissued the RFA actually last year and, and are about to add uh, a few more groups to this to, to kind of expand um, uh, the consortium. We work very closely at NHGRI in this consortium with a, a separate group, the Return of Results Consortium out of our ELSI uh, group. Um, these are our, our grants uh, variety, a lot of the, the big names in ELSI research, and uh, we actually meet uh, at least once a year together and, and uh, obviously tackle a lot of the same issues. A lot of the work coming out of uh, CSER is actually coming, is going to come from our working groups. These are very important to us. Um, we want to develop recommendations, survey different approaches for clinical sequencing. Um, so uh, the dissemination of this will come through these working groups. Um, just real quickly, phenotypes, how to, how to standardize some phenotypes and be able to, to get some interoperability in the phenotype area. Sequencing standards led by Levi Garraway. This is kind of, we, we mentioned this this morning about in standards. An interesting thing they're doing is we have five groups doing exome sequencing and uh, um, they're surveying coverage. There are, for example, the 57 genes uh, recommended for re return of results for incidental findings by ACMG. Uh, several of those genes are actually very poorly covered in the exome cap capture, or at least a region, and usually the five prime region is very poorly covered in the exome capture methods. So we're trying to understand this and, and develop some better approaches to get at least thorough coverage of those genes that we think are important. Uh, Constant questions around actionability. Um, this group actually has a, a, a paper submitted that, that just kind of surveys the different approaches we uh, in CSER that are being taken to, to make judgments about clinical actionability. Uh, EMRs, how to get these data into the EMRs, psychosocial measures, um, still working on informed consent, uh, um, never solved uh, pediatrics, and this is another uh, emperor. They took clever take on the Caesar name, but this is a return, another return of results group. So uh, this is where a lot of the products from Caesar will be coming from. Uh, just to give you a little update, uh, these are now a little over a year into their grants, um, and um, um, through the, all six uh, awards, there have been 455 people consented as, as patients, participants. 170s have, have been sequenced as of last month, and results are beginning to go back um, to these patients, particip participants. Of course, a lot of this also is uh, the physicians are very important participants in these studies. Uh, we're studying physician preferences, patient preferences, uh, really studying in, in an empirical manner uh, uh, the interactions that occur and, and the preferences that, that occur as we return uh, sequencing results. A lot of physicians also have already been recruited. Um, just in the last few slides, just to give you a, a little more flavor for some of the questions Caesar's tackling. Uh, on the incidental findings area, uh, all are reporting incidental findings. Uh, half included, the incidental findings automatically go into their primary indication report, and then half of the groups actually have a diagnostic report and then a separate incidental finding report. Um, uh, most sites allow opt-out. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, most patients do not opt out of the medically actionable incidental findings. Um, uh, some cases, we, it's not even uh, an option in these studies. And uh, all allow uh, non-medically actual uh, incidental findings for the patients to opt out, except for um, Brigham and Women's, which part of their study is actually to do healthy patients and whole genome sequencing. Um, so what categories of incidental findings, uh, the, the full gamut, disease risk, carrier status, uh, pharmacogenomic variants, um, and, and you can't actually get blood group from exome sequencing, but you can from whole genome. Um, what types of disease risks are returned? Um, um, 
some of our groups have a predefined gene list uh, for what they will return to patients in terms of disease risk. Um, and then others are using, are actually doing this on a case-by-case -case basis uh, and uh, a, a kind of, a, I would say, non-scalable uh, uh, board type approach to, to make decision patient by patient. Um, all these groups do have one of these multidisciplinary committees to make decisions about actionability and, and what to return. Uh, um, um, again, uh, some do it case by case. Uh, Baylor has, has, has really kind of taken a lead here, the Baylor College of Medicine led by Sharon Plon. Um, and, and they're now doing over 200 people uh, in their clinical sequencing uh, group each month. Um, and then others have this uh, a priori categorization. Um, we haven't really touched fully on this. The variant classifications um, intend to return pathogenic and variants of, of unknown significance for the primary indication for the patient, uh, and then pathogenic variants for, for incidental findings. Um, but then a big challenge is, is how do you determine this? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we don't really understand the biology fully yet, certainly. So what's, the, what's sufficient evidence for pathogenicity? And of course, you know, all these groups, everybody dives into the literature and the databases as they are. And you know, you, they find things like reported as pathogenic, segregates with disease in a family, um, or in some cases, a, a, a new variant will, will have uh, no literature record, of course. And then how do you predict potential pathogenicity? So this, this is a huge challenge uh, that's, that's being tackled now. CRVR, we hope, will help. Um, um, but a lot of this, um, you know, really is going to take, as we were just talking about, the evidence generation and the, uh, even uh, some, some research on, on the functional aspects of new variants. Okay, with that, uh, um, I'll, I'll stop. And if there are any questions um, about the CSER program or any of this, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, Pearl? Have you ever talked or asked the CSER participants what they would see as a national policy? I mean, I just think they've been playing in this field. It might be an interesting, you know, to bounce back on some of these groups kind of what we're struggling with. No, I mean, we, they, they tackle things like CLIA. Uh, all the groups have developed CLIA and, and dealt with that. And, and now we're talking more about reimbursement uh, for some of the assays and, and that sort of thing. But, but no grand strategy. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, Lucy. So, so one thing I might just add is, as part of CSER, we just within the past couple months funded a coordinating center. So that's Gail Jarvik at the University of Washington, and we did that in part because we recognize that although clinical sequencing is being done individually at institutions, I think we have an opportunity with CSER to sort of get at some of these larger issues and figure out what lessons um, these groups have learned and best practices that we can share, and I think the coordinating center is going to have a key role in doing that, as well as any sort of education and outreach um, of, to professional societies. I mean, um, we just had our steering committee meeting last week, and I think we had a very lively discussion of the ACMG recommendations, among other things. So in that consortium, people wear um, many hats, including um, representation in the ACMG and, and um, pending efforts um, and clinically relevant variants and so forth. So I think there's, there's going to be um, much yet to come. Karen? Oh. Uh, yeah. Can you, you mentioned the meeting in September for research. Um, can you go back to that slide and just? Maybe. Yeah, I'm not a big data expert, but maybe somebody here is. <laughs> yeah. Enabling. Enabling research use of clinical data in September. So that's just getting organized, and I think chairs have been selected, and they're just formulating uh, their plan. I don't know if anybody know. Did that help? Yeah. Okay, Karen? Yeah. Um, this is a difficult question, so I'm going to ask it to Brad, and I also want to ask it to Les. And that's the relationship between the research that we're doing and the process that ACMG went through. Um, because it looks like you're asking a lot of questions 
that may have some relevance to ACMG's decision making. And you had some of those people on the committee. And I, I have a worry um, that there may be some unintended consequences of pushing ahead. I understand the need for the list or the charge of a list, um, but there are some big leaps that were made here. And we have some research that is being done that may be asking some of those questions. So it's a difficult question to respond to, but I didn't know if either Brad or Les or whoever else was here. And you, as you pointed out, some of the people that were in the deliberation are also doing the research. So what you have you I, I can speak to that point, I think. You know, we, we certainly recognize that there are efforts underway to gain data that will help to answer these questions, but the truth is that this is being used today as we speak, clinically, and people aren't waiting for these studies to begin to apply this, and so there was a strong feeling that there needed to be a flag planted somewhere to give a standard and guidelines with full recognition that we are going to learn more as time passes and likely need to revisit various aspect, uh, aspects of these guidelines in light of that new data. But you can't wait what could end up being years, perhaps, for the outcomes of these studies when clinicians are using them right now. Um, I just follow up. Did you consider whether it would be reasonable or even unethical for clinicians together with patients to choose to opt out. So they would just want certain information, but not all that you have on your lit test, because that's happening. And that's actually coming out of the discussions with some of the Caesars. And it's an interesting research question. But I just wondered if you actually, obviously you've made a decision about that. Um, you set a standard, but it's happening. So I was wondering your views on that or Brad, if you want to chime in, that's the thing. So you're asking if we considered the possibility that people would choose not to? That, that, that the clinician, it gets to Pearl's point earlier, that this role of the clinician together with the patient as a couple, and vis-a-vis -vis the role of the lab and the ordering, and the patient that just says, and I, you know, I came here for a reason, I'm not interested in that, and the answer is, well, then, then what? Then you don't get Warner, this. Mark seemed, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think there are several points, and obviously that was a, mm -hmm. we, we discussed this quite a lot, and I think the, the things that I identify as being, um, uh, that bear on that the most appropriate layer, I think people are confusing uh, the idea that somehow whole genome sequencing is a standard of care, and that if we don't offer whole genome sequencing with people, uh, you know, having the option to pick and choose, that we're somehow uh, withholding something vital to their uh, health and well-being. And the reality is, as we've been talking about over the last uh, day and a half, uh, is that this is, you know, emergent. And as with many things, it's emerging into practice probably well ahead of, you know, what is going to ultimately be best practice. So that was one contention. The second one is, is that there is a body of literature that shows that asking people to make choices about opting out in a hypothetical situation based on presenting hypotheticals of if we were to find this, that, or the other thing, uh, that when people are faced with the real situation as opposed to the hypothetical situation, they choose very differently right. uh, than, uh, than they've done. And so we thought that it would be presumptuous to uh, assume that people could really truly make uh, an informed uh, condition in the pretest setting to do an opt out. Now, again, the point that is important and relevant here is that, as Les pointed out, the result comes back to the clinician. And we expect that there will be a, a discussion between the clinician and the patient at that point as to whether or not uh, results um, that have been returned from the laboratory to the clinician will, in fact, be. Uh, return to the patient, and that we think is where that conversation is most appropriate to take place because that really reflects what um, is done in other medical practices. So to reinforce what Les has said, what we're really trying to do is to move genetics from our exceptional position into something that is much more concordant 
with uh, standard medical practice. And, and so this was, you know, so the bottom line is, is we spent a lot of time on this. Those, for me, were the arguments that were the most compelling as to why we elected not to do a pretest opt out. And my uh, position uh, in our uh, um, uh, uh, clinical research approach is that if people are uncomfortable with the <laughs> idea of in incidental findings, that the autonomy is don't do this test. We will do everything else in our power to use alternative methods to make a diagnosis. But if you do not want this information, then this is not the test for you. Well, one of the things that was interesting to me last week in the discussions was th th this isn't going to be an overnight shift in the clinical labs. You know, there's actually going to be some slow progress made as they, as they think about how to implement the ACMG recommendations and, and how best to employ, to deploy their resources in, in doing this and, and make sure they do it in a responsibility in a responsible way. Um, so, so both the practical aspects of, of, of interrogating these 57 genes, but also working with their IRBs and, and how, to, how to do it. I, I'd like to sort of just advocate one more time for the, for the idea of sort of creating very large data sets of variants coupled to clinical data, because I think that's really going to be the only way to deal with the, the one-offs I don't think we're ever going to get to unless you understand the biology, but the people who have the, the 0.5 percent variant that we just don't know what to do with, I, I think the only way is forward is, is the phenotype, genotype data set, and like Les said, the phenotype is what is what really rules there. So finding out what happens to people with these BRCA1 or MYH7 variants over time. And they exist, you know, the frustrating thing is that they exist. Myriad could do it. Uh, GeneDx can do it if they put some effort into it or somebody can partner with them or something. Okay, I think we need to move on. Thanks, Brad. Um, Last presentation before break um, is going to be Lynn Dressler.